The Archons are of major importance, not only in lore, but throughout Teyvat's very history and cultures. Hailed as deities and leaders of their respective nations, and skilled warriors in their own right. You would have to be in order to survive one of the darkest and most violent points in the history of this world. With a new Archon about to join us very soon this year in Sumeru, let's take a look back at the three we have met so far, as we look at some amazing facts about our most treasured and beloved Archons themselves, with these interesting and amazing facts at our soldier Poet King, as one bard would put it. But first… Before we begin though, if you enjoy Teyvat's facts and wisdom, be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you enjoy the content. After the video is over, join us over in our community discord server, where we talk all about Genshin including lore. Ok, with that said, let's open the Teyvatchinary and see what's been uncovered. For starters, let's look at the very first Archon we meet, Venti, also known by his real name, Barbados. He is first introduced to us very early on when we meet him and Devalin in the woods. But Venti is like all Archons, more than meets the eye. That cheerful, mischievous, and carefree personality is very deceptive. So here are some interesting facts about the God of Freedom. The appearance you see Venti in is not his true form. He is in fact a wind sprite as you can see here. Quite adorable, don't you think? Venti seems to carry some similarities, not just to wind spirits, but the wind spirits in mythology known as Sylph. Sylphs were one of the four major elemental spirits and held control over the air and wind. They are often depicted as fairy-like creatures with vast knowledge of things mortal men lack. They were very sought after by alchemists for their control of the wind element too. They are a very common subject in plays, poetry, and other media, and their influence on mythology has shifted through the ages. Like all the current Archons we met, Venti has suffered loss and traumas through his life. Before Venti became an Archon or had a human form, he met a young bard, befriending him. The two became very close, and Venti loved the boy's ballads. Eventually, they worked together, along with many others, to take down the God of Winds himself, freeing the people from tyranny. But it came at a cost. The bard was killed. In fact, the form we see Venti in now, he took to look like his late friend. Venti is actually very allergic to cats. Weird, ain't it? The God of Freedom himself is allergic to one of the animals that are the most carefree and do as they please. He starts sneezing whenever cats are near and refuses to go near them. Maybe that's why he prefers Angel Share's tavern. We actually had to get his lyre strings back from a cat because of these allergies. I honestly feel bad for Venti. Allergies aren't fun, regardless if you're an immortal being or mortal. Next up, we have a popular favorite for many, the handsome, wise, and very broke Archon himself, Zhang Li, aka Morax. He is first introduced to us through the 11th Harbinger himself, over a business discussion during lunch. At the time, we know him only as the skilled and culture consultant of one of the oldest funeral parlors in Teyvat. It isn't until later we learn the truth of him being Morax. So let's take a look at some interesting facts on our retired Archon, shall we? Zhang Li is like the others, not human. Pretty obvious on that. He is a dragon Keelan hybrid adeptus, the prime of the adepti as he called himself. In a sense, this made him a king or emperor of the adepti. Dragons in Chinese mythology are vital entities in their tales, being symbols of the Chinese emperor. They are also key symbols for wealth and prosperity. There is even a year of the dragon in the Chinese zodiac. Dragons in Chinese mythology in particular were said to shape the very land and even became China's rivers. There is even one myth of a carp that became a dragon by jumping a waterfall. But the most intriguing is the benevolence most Asian dragons tend to have seen as beings of great wisdom and knowledge. Zhang Li is one of the veterans from the Archon War, and one of the oldest, and was loved by the people of Liyue. But did you know that he isn't just a master of war and business? Zhang Li is actually a skilled blacksmith, and has forged his own weapons to use in those dark times. The name Chrysos from Zhang Li's constellation is actually from Greek mythology. It is the name of a child of Zeus, and is the god of gold and riches personified. 
Not much can sadly be found on this not very well-known child of the famous king of gods from mythology, unfortunately. Nevertheless, it is very interesting. If you've followed me for a while now, you know how much of a Raiden fan I am. The sisters, Baal and Beelzebul, were their real names, but we know them simply as A and Makoto, both a perfect example of yin and yang, light and shadow. They, unknown to their nation, created their nation together, striving for a single goal in mind. Sadly, only A is left. So let's look at some facts about the Electro Archons themselves. As mentioned before, A and Makoto are described as polar opposites of each other. Makoto was actually the Archon and Shogun during her life, while A acted as her bodyguard and body double during more dangerous matters. Not surprising, as in real life, royalty and nobles sometimes did have somebody act as a body double, but bodyguards were far more common. A and Makoto might actually take inspiration from the sibling gods from Japanese mythology, Raijin and Fujin, the gods of thunder and wind. Raijin in particular was known by many names. Kaminari, Raiden, Narukami, and Raiko are just some examples. Raijin was never far from his brother Fujin, and often sometimes was seen in the company of his son, Raitaro. Wonder if that's where they got the inspiration for a certain ball of deer as well. Quite possibly is the case. Everywhere you look, there is a heavy mirror symbolism in regards to the Electro Archon, A and her puppet. I mean, it's everywhere with her, from her trailer, to her, and Shogun, to even her own backstory. Even her claim of Euthymia versus the outside world is a mirror symbolism. Reality versus dreams, fantasy versus fact, tradition versus progress, yin versus yang, it's all there with her and Inazuma. Even in A's most recent part two story quest, this is the most apparent, as we even get a shattering mirror symbolism. Mirrors in themselves are symbolic, showing the truth to the beholder, awareness, and wisdom. Casting away doubts and revealing what lies beneath the surface. Mirrors in many cultures are said to hold great powers, and Japan was no exception, having even mirror yokai and magic mirrors. In A's case, it symbolized her journey and change along her path to eternity. Well, that wraps up these quick facts on our three archons for now. We learned so much about them, and we're about to get a new one this summer in Sumeru. I wonder what Kusanali has to reveal to us and what she might be hiding in Sumeru. Also, is Baiju really the Dendro Archon? I guess we'll find out soon enough. But for now though, I'm gonna close the Teivachinary. Thanks so much for watching. And with that said, I will see you in the future for more Genshin Impact content and lore.